All right. Welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. Thank you all for coming. Um, I am very excited uh, about today's event. We have um, Commissioner Pierre Moscovici of the, uh, of the European Commissioner, Commissioner for Economic and Financial Affairs, Taxation and Customs. I think we will touch upon all of those uh, areas of policymaking today. Uh, Commiss Commissioner uh, Moscovici has served in the European Parliament, the French National Assembly. He has also been the French Minister for European Affairs and for uh, the Economy and Finance. Um, uh, after uh, Commissioner Moscovici's uh, remarks, we're going to have a uh, conversation. Um, after that, we'll break for lunch, and then we'll do a panel, panel discussion of the uh, uh, taxation proposals uh, uh, presented here. Um, and uh, I hope you uh, will all enjoy this as much as I think I will. Um, and without further ado, uh, Mr. Commissioner, please go ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, um, it's a great pleasure for me to, to join you today uh, because it's a welcome opportunity for me to explain to an American audience how we see the challenges and opportunities brought by the digital economy, to start with, I will concentrate on that, uh, especially when it comes to taxation, which is my field of competence in the um, EU Commission. And of course, I'm here also to hear your views, to exchange point of views, uh, and uh, we will have the occasion to express that, I'm sure, uh, quite frankly, just as it should be. Uh, let me uh, start by saying one thing very clearly, digitalization has had a, a major transformative effect on economic fundamentals and is highly beneficial to our economy. And you won't find uh, in this commission anything which is negative to uh, the digital transformation. We want to embrace uh, this opportunity and, and work with the digital companies that are spearheading this uh, profound transformation. Uh, we see a strong digital single market as the key uh, to maintaining Europe's position as one of the world's leading economies, and we want to uh, reinforce that to enhance our capacities, uh, to preserve the uh, competitiveness of our industrial base, and to our remaining uh, uh, a global leader uh, in uh, these key sectors. So the digitalization of uh, the economy is crucial to maintaining this position, and that's uh, clearly our purpose and our will. As a Commissioner for Economic and Financial Affairs, I'm very much aware of the contribution of the digital industry uh, to our economy in Europe. The transformation and communication, the information and communication technologies uh, sector generates 25% of total business uh, R&D. Investment in uh, ICT is responsible for 50% of productivity growth, and this is a remarkable achievement. One of which we want to continue to uh, build. Uh, as part of building the uh, digital single market and fostering growth, the European Commission uh, is determined also to preserve a level playing field, uh, to promote Europe's general interest and to ensure fairness, which is, uh, of course, a key point. And in this context, uh, we must r recognize that regardless of its indignable benefits on which I insisted, the digital economy also brings unprecedented challenges. So let me uh, set out some of these uh, challenges, uh, which explain why we are moving in the direction we are uh, taking. First, uh, digital companies are growing faster than the economy um, as a whole. In the last seven years, uh, the average annual revenue growth uh, for the top digital firms was around 14%. Uh, compared to around 3% uh, for IT and telecoms and 0% or 0.2% for other multinationals. And the gap there is widening. Second, development in terms of uh, market capitalization is even more impressive. In 2006, uh, technology companies only represented 7% uh, of the market capitalization of the 20 largest players. Uh, in 2017, they accounted already for 54%. So, do not get me wrong, this is good news. Again, uh, we want the digital economy to reach its uh, full potential in Europe too, but these positive uh, developments have also made some issues more salient. 
and I have exposed the um, outdated nature of some of our uh, regulatory framework, and, uh, especially in taxation. Corporate tax frameworks, uh, in particular, have not been able to keep up. Uh, they were conceived in a pre-internet age in Europe one century ago, basically, and they are <laughs> confounded by today's mobile, uh, globalized, uh, and digital companies. Uh, they rely heavily on the concept of physical presence, and they are underpinned by the uh, simple principle that profits should be taxed where value is created. Yet, uh, digitalization has uh, shaken this principle to its core. In a digitalized world, uh, by definition, it can be difficult to pin down the value that has been created, uh, how it has been created, and where uh, it should be uh, taxed. What is uh, visible here is a deep schism uh, between where digital uh, profits are generated and where they are taxed, uh, if uh, uh, at all. And this is a problem uh, on two levels. First, there is a question of fairness. Uh, on average, uh, as far as we can know, domestic digitalized businesses models are subject to an effective tax rate of only 9%. And this is an average. We know that in some countries, for some business, the effective tax rate is uh, rather close to zero uh, than to nine. This is uh, less than half compared to traditional business uh, models facing an effective tax rate of 21st, 21%. Uh, so there is a question of fairness and level playing field there. Second, as the um, digital economy overtakes the traditional economy in terms of market presence, uh, our member states, we are a union of 28 member states, uh, face shrunken tax bases and, and ride up revenues. And this is where I take off my taxation hat and put on for a second my economic and fiscal hat. One of the lingering legacies of the uh, crisis is high public debt. Uh, and to reverse that development, we want to do that in Europe, governments have to secure their tax bases. That calls for a fundamental overall of our corporate uh, tax systems. Of course, um, ideally, this should take place at the global level. I will come back on that. Uh, to contribute to the uh, international discussions we're in, and tonight there will be a G20 meeting uh, here in Washington for finance ministers, the Commission set out some concrete proposals a month ago, almost uh, exactly, uh, to address current shortcomings in uh, corporate taxation. Our proposals are a basis for discussion among our 28 member states. They need to be approved by each of them and all of them, uh, but we very much hope that they can give further impetus to the uh, global uh, debate. Uh, there is one message that I really want to take away from here today, and that is that our proposals are absolutely not about uh, targeting the United States or any individual American companies. I hate uh, them to be called the GAFA tax because that's not what they are. Our goal is to ensure a level playing field for all businesses operating in our single market, whether they are uh, EU-based or not, digital or traditional, large or small. So it's a, it's a wider uh, reform of our corporate tax system. Let me also add that we've been working on these proposals for many months. Uh, since well before the U.S. Uh, tax reform was agreed, uh, let alone the recent uh, trade measures. We've been working in close consultation with digital businesses, and I met quite a lot of your uh, companies of, or companies, um, uh, as well uh, with uh, the European partners, with the OECD, with our international uh, partners. Rather, our uh, proposals are designed in such a way as to capture certain activities that create value in the EU. I wrote to Steven Minuchin, whom I will meet just after uh, our discussion here recently, with the aim of making that clear. Uh, and I will uh, reiterate that to him in a few minutes from now. So what are our proposals? Um, as we uh, stated already back in September last year, we regard uh, an ambitious, workable, and effective international approach as the best solution to digital taxation. I said it was not anti-US or anti-this or that company. It's certainly not anti-global. We are the defenders of the uh, global approach. Uh, mm, this is self-evident. 
given the globalized, mobile, and highly complex uh, nature of the problem. We welcome the OECD's uh, interim report on the, this issue that is presented to the G20 in Buenos Aires last month. But let's also be honest, uh, the international progress we have seen does not give cause for much optimism on either the pace uh, or scope of the digital reforms uh, we can expect. There has been very little appetite among uh, key uh, global players to find concrete solutions until now. Meanwhile, EU member states have been very clear that they want solutions uh, sooner rather than later. Our 28 finance ministers expressed in December 2017 that they looked forward uh, to appropriate commission proposals by early 2018, uh, taking into account uh, developments in the OECD ongoing discussions. And so uh, that's why the commission presented its own proposals on the 21st of March for the fair and effective taxation of the digital economy. First of all, we put forward, and we insist on that, a, a common EU solution for the taxation of the digital economy in the EU, uh, enabling member states to tax profits made in their territory, even if a company does not have a physical presence there. This means introducing the concept of significant digital presence in EU law. The new rules would ensure that online businesses contribute to public finances at the same level as traditional brick and mortar uh, companies. This proposal is accompanied by a recommendation uh, to member states to amend uh, their double taxation treaties with third countries so that the same rules apply to EU and non-EU companies, uh, really avoiding double taxation is one of our goals. Our aim here is to give impetus to the international debate and help push our global partners to act while uh, resolving the tensions in our uh, digital single market. Our uh, proposals address the problems of uh, where to tax uh, by finding a fair and balanced way to establish taxing rights, uh, taking into account that the business may provide digital services to users in the market without being physically present, and what to tax by establishing a, a fair and effective way to, to reflect new forms of value creation, such as the user contribution, which is the decisive concept, uh, in the allocation of profits. In parallel, in the EU, we will also work with uh, member states to integrate such digital uh, solutions into our proposed common consolidated corporate tax base, CCCTB, which is our flagship proposal uh, aiming to create a more stable environment for businesses to grow and expand. And as I said, this structural, long-term, international approach is the most important for us and for me. Secondly, in parallel to our work on a comprehensive solution to digital taxation, we have also presented something which is more spectacular, but uh, less fundamental, but that's the way politics are sometimes, but still important, a proposal for an interim targeted measure. And I insist on interim. A tax for digital services, which should only apply until a comprehensive solution is agreed at international level. The main aim uh, of this proposed um, tax is to avoid the potential problems arising from a patchwork of national digital tax measures uh, mushrooming around our single market. Um, EU member states are, are increasingly uh, frustrated at their inability uh, to tax the digital ac activity within the borders. And many are taking or planning to take unilateral uh, measures in response. But such uncoordinated sticking plasters will only create a great uncertainty, legal clashes, and high compliance costs for businesses in the EU. And this, in turn, will undermine the competitiveness of our single market. And this is why, uh, with the, the risk of the proliferation of responses uh, driving uh, us away from each other, away from a common vision, uh, as each member state then wants its solution to be followed by others, we had to make our proposals uh, common and now. This digital services tax would target those activities that are impossible to capture with uh, today's rules, uh, where user participation, uh, again, and user contributions uh, play a central role in value creation. That means services that generate their main profits through user data, uh, e.g. Uh, social media, 
uh, and search engines, and second, services uh, provided by marketplaces or interfaces that facilitate transactions between different users, like online platforms that allow users to buy and sell goods and services to other users. The design of the digital uh, services tax is the result of a careful analysis uh, of many different factors and impacts, including the tax burden of businesses with different margin profits. The, set, the rate is set at 3%, as you know. Uh, the tax should be deductible from the corporate tax base paid by companies to mitigate any uh, double taxation risk again. The threshold of 750 million euros on global revenues will ensure that smaller businesses do not fall into the scope. We don't want to damage startups or sta scale-ups. That's not the point. And for these uh, large players that will fall under the new uh, tax, so while they do not make any profit, it has to be noted that they are usually loss-making as a result of a strategic choice, um, high IP cost, or profit reinvestment. Here also, our goal is to ensure level uh, playing field. So, uh, I wanted to inform you about that, but also to be uh, as short as possible so we can have a dialogue. Uh, let me conclude. Uh, the European Commission strongly believes that the um, approach to the taxation of the digital economy must uh, ultimately be a global one. We are fully invested in that global approach. Uh, this is in line with the need to better harness globalization with uh, proper gov global governance and global rules. The future of corporate taxation cannot be uh, an unilateral national or regional one. Uh, the global economy is far too advanced uh, for that. We must continue, and we will continue to work with our international partners, starting with the US, uh, to find common ground and to push for ambitious reforms of the international tax system. Meanwhile, the initiative I've outlined uh, to you today will give further impetus to the um, international discussions by providing, and that's where we want to show leadership, a clear example of how the principles under discussions at international level can be transformed into a modern, fair and efficient corporate taxation framework adapted to the digital era. But uh, by being a first mover in uh, uh, proposing an overarching response to fix the issue and to mitigate the immediate risks, uh, the EU and its member states uh, intend to be at the forefront uh, of efforts to shape a global solution. Uh, this is the philosophy and this is also uh, the way everything is designed. Uh, I have no secret for you and now I'm ready to discuss that with you. Um, where, when, how much, whatever you want. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay. Well, let's start out with the with the spectacular, if you uh, if you may. Um, there are, I think, uh, a lot of people on this side of the of the Atlantic who who see the the interim proposal that you that you talked about, um, and you alluded to this to this concern as basically a a tariff on American tech firms. That a lot of the firms, that, a lot of the activity that would be subject to this new tax uh, is, is activity carried out by American firms. Um, people would argue a lot of the value added, the intellectual property is created here in the US. Um, and they see this 3% uh, tax rate on, on revenue especially as really the equivalent of a, of a tariff. What would you say to, to, to concerns like that? One thing uh, is undeniable is that uh, the uh, US firms uh, are uh, leaders in that field, and I cannot deny that. Uh, but th what I can deny and want to deny is that this is an anti-American approach. Um, that's why I, I don't like the uh, GAFA tax uh, motto or uh, slogan. This is not what we intend to do. Um, what we want to do is to tax all companies, whether they are American or non-American, uh, where they create profits and value, and to do that in a reasonable, proportionate, and I think quite intelligent way. Um, and as far as I know, because we, we were not targeting firms, we were trying to define a global and coherent approach, there would be between 120 and 180 firms that could be uh, enshrined in our uh, corporate taxation approach. 
those companies who are over 750 million euros uh, turnover uh, per year, 15 mil 50 million million in uh, the EU itself. Um, as far as we know, then, because again, it's not uh, on firms that we are working, but on the uh, architecture, um, half of these firms would be American, one third would be uh, European, the rest, or the rest of the world, basically uh, Asian. So no, it's not the GAFA tax, it's not four companies, uh, and even the GAFAs are not uh, all targeted the same way. If I take the example of Amazon, which is a GAFA, by definition, uh, uh, where Amazon has, uh, organizes physical sales, well, it's not taxed because it's already taxed, it's only the intermediation side which would be taxed. Um, it's not an anti-US tax, it's not a protectionist approach. This was all uh, thought and uh, designed before there were any kind of uh, debate between us, either on tax reform and mentioning uh, trade uh, problems. And um, uh, it is our contribution also to the global approach in OECD and G20. And that's uh, the message I will carry again and again, uh, that I will carry to Stephen Mnuchin in a few minutes, because we need to avoid any kind of misunderstanding. Uh, yes, we are going to uh, establish our taxation system, hopefully, uh, but it's not anti-American, uh, it's not anti-digital. It's something that, uh, in my way, is rather the way to the future. Well, let's, let's talk a little more then about the sort of conceptual basis of the activities that are that will be subject to this interim tax. So you, you focus on the idea that it's the users that create value uh, in, these, in these cases. Um, this is a dig digital activity that uh, you know, could use some lighter taxation, I think, with it not being carried out successfully yet. Um, so when, you know, I think the way economists typically think about this is, you know, if I go to the grocery store and I buy some cheese, that cheese really, you know, it really has no value until I consume it, right? I enjoy the cheese and that's the moment when the, when the value is generated. Um, I think you can say that about a lot of products, right? You know, a car doesn't really have value unless someone drives it. Where do you, so conceptually, where do you draw the line between sort of that kind of traditional consumption behavior and the sort of user engagement driven value that, that, that you spoke of earlier and that is subject to this tax? How do you see that conceptually? Well, uh, maybe authorize me to, to come back uh, for a second. Uh, and I want to repeat that because I want it to be very clear. For the Commission, for myself, the most important is the structural approach. Uh, basically, firms should be taxed where they create profits. Uh, the problem is that we don't have uh, a means to do that because uh, our corporate taxation system relies on pr physical presence and uh, digital companies do not need to have a physical presence to create profits uh, and, and value. And so we need to uh, build, uh, really, the significant digital presence as the concept uh, on which we can base a, a structural approach as well national and European through CCDB. And uh, I didn't ask for another approach. And this is, to me, the decisive approach. Then, uh, the reason why uh, we are uh, making the interim proposal is that because we cannot wait. If we wait, we will have uh, 5, 10, uh, 15, 28 uh, national uh, digital taxation on turnover, uh, which are not going to be as intelligent uh, or as clever or as coherent. And we want to avoid that because it's neither good for us as a single market, neither good for business. Uh, but uh, again, I repeat that. Interim means interim. Uh, I don't want that to become uh, the definite regime. No uh, great movie fan, I love Alien. In the beginning, it's quite small, and in the end, well, it breaks the cabin. And I don't want to, to create a monster. I want to have something which is uh, targeted uh, in time, which is also proportionate. It's a 3% rate. Uh, this tax is supposed to provide us something like 5 billion, 5 billion euros revenues. Well, that's significant, but that's not monstrous. That's not going to kill anybody. That's not going to create any kind of delocalization. And we then reflected 
as the most clever way to do that. And yes, we uh, move to user uh, value, uh, especially uh, measured by uh, publicity resources. And that's why, uh, finally, there's three main sectors that uh, will be incorporated in, in our tax if it uh, is decided by member states, because uh, let's not forget that we need unanimity uh, votes in the council for that, 28 member states. Some of them might be a little reluctant, or very reluctant. Others has, have to be pushy, uh, those who asked us to uh, deliver uh, on that. Uh, uh, then it would be, again, uh, social medias, uh, research, uh, and uh, platforms, which are the basis of this proposal. So let's talk a little more uh, about the fundamentals and about mm -hmm. the, the process that you just mentioned. So what the Commission released is two proposed directives. Mm -hmm. um, of course, the European Union uh, has a different setup from the the U.S. system. Could you talk a little bit about how, how how a directive becomes a law? What the process is from here on out? What do you think the chances are that these directives will actually turn into national tax legislation? Some of you might wonder, what is a commissioner? <laughs> uh, commissioner is There's in, one in, here, uh, yeah, right yeah. here. Yeah. A commissioner is not a bureaucrat, tries not to be. Uh, it's certainly a political appointee. Uh, we are controlled by a parliament, the European Parliament. Uh, and. Uh, I was before the finance minister of my country. I've been minister several times, uh, MP or congressman for quite a while, uh, as well at the European national level. But I'm not the minister of finance of Europe. Uh, sometimes I'm more and sometimes I'm less. Um, uh, we are more uh, than ministers because we have the monopoly of initiative. Every proposal has to come out of the commission, especially in the uh, taxation field. Well, uh, I mean, sometimes I'm the taxation czar, not at all but I'm the only one in capacity to make a proposal. Then, when the decision is taken, uh, we are also responsible for implementation. And basically, let's not be too, too technical, but you will have a discussion after that with uh, Stephen Quest, our DG, who is here and who knows uh, much more than I do on, on, on everything, uh, but specifically on technicalities. A directive is a law. The problem is how to transform the proposal we made into a directive which is a law. And for that, the decision-making process is quite simple. In some fields, uh, a qualified majority voting between our 28 member states is sufficient. In other fields, and that is the case for taxation, we need to have unanimity at 28. So uh, for those who like our proposals, uh, they uh, need to watch that carefully. For those who don't like it, they can have some hope. Uh, we need to convince 28 member states that this proposal is the right one, and it's only when they agree on that uh, that it becomes a directive than a law, uh, basically, because after that it's a problem of implementation. It has to be transposed into uh, national uh, rights, but it takes uh, little time. But when it has been decide decided, especially at unanimity by 28 member states, you can be sure that it will become uh, the law uh, for uh, each of them. Uh, maybe two elements of, uh, of schedule. Um, I, we need to decide on that before the end of this year, so it's quite speedy, uh, because if not, we enter into what you know here as everywhere, uh, 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 an electoral uh, scheme or an electoral process, because we have got European elections in uh, May, and of course it's mm, very difficult to gain consensus in that period, then we will have an, a new commission, this commission uh, stops its mandate in November 19. So basically, we've got two presidencies of the Union now, Bulgaria, then Austria, and we need to finish that by the end of 2018. Finish that means deciding on that. Then there will be a date for implementation, which would, could be something like 2020. And your, your dream would be that the decision would be on both proposed directives? or Yes, because uh, again, I, uh, it's not something I say to, to please anybody here. Uh, my preference, uh, my uh, priority goes to the structural uh, reform. Um, and this one, uh, I think, uh, could be something that uh, is a real strong contribution to, uh, to a global solution. Uh, but uh, if there is an interim proposal, is also because I'm aware that the uh, structural reform will take some time, probably more time, and that uh, I'm pushed by member states and also I'm pushed by the reality 
that if we don't act collectively, they will act nationally. And that acting nationally is always worse for business <coughs> than acting collectively. Very good. Let's, um, let's open it up to the audience and take a few questions, if that uh, sounds good to you. Um, Perfect. Any takers? Let's go uh, over here in the back. Please wait for the mic. Uh, say who you are. Do not deliver a prepared essay and ask with a question mark, please. Hi. Uh, my name is Mindy Hirsfeld. Uh, I wanted to ask you about GAFA and your point about that 54% of the total market cap is uh, digital companies. And it seems to me that the fact, I, I don't know what percent of that 54% are, are U.S. companies uh, as opposed to European, but I would assume it's pretty high. Um, it seems that the fact that GAFA are all U.S. companies uh, poses a larger long-term threat to the European tax base than how much tax those companies are paying. And I don't hear a lot of discussion about that issue. The discussion just seems to be focused on how much tax U.S. companies are paying as to what, uh, opposed to why. So this is an economics hat question. Not a yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I will respond politically to this economic question uh, because I, I don't have the detailed data. I imagine, yes, that those companies represent a quite uh, important share of those 54%, uh, but I would repeat that it's not an anti-GAFA, it's not an anti-American uh, tax. Uh, but um, I, I truly believe that we should cooperate. Uh, you know, our proposals are not uh, improvised. Uh, we are preparing them very carefully. That means that we are studying on impact assessment, that we are also leading public consultations. And I myself met a lot of stakeholders, a lot of people from the business and this includes, of course, representatives from the so-called GAFAs. Uh, and I think it's of their interest to, to cooperate. That is also a question of image. Uh, there, there are discussions, problems, scandals around data on the one hand. And on the other hand, there is the idea that some of these companies don't pay their fair share of tax where they should. Uh, I don't want to pinpoint one single company, but there have been decisions taken by my colleague on competition, Margaret Vestager, for some companies, I'm not going to name this, uh, which pays 0.05% uh, corporate tax in, in the country in Europe that I don't need to name either. And this is not uh, something which is good uh, for the taxpayer, for the member states, for the EU, and also for the image of the firm. And that's why we need to cooperate. Again, uh, 5 billion euros is uh, significant amount of money, it's well, it's not uh, the Atlantic Ocean. And I think that we, we can live with that. And that's why we want to have a cooperative approach uh, also with those companies. I think that they can understand uh, also for their own image, uh, for their own impact, that being uh, uh, transparent on data and controlled on data on the one hand, and good citizens, uh, as far as the tax problem is uh, concerned, uh, well, it would be a progress. Sorry if it's not economics, but I think that's something very important. I'm going <coughs> to use my prerogative to ask one more question. In the, in the uh, fundamental version of your proposal, the, um, the criteria for a significant digital presence are basically you know, revenue from a certain country mm -hmm. or number of consumers. Or um, number of contracts. Or number of contracts. The, but, the, but those are absolute numbers. Um, does that mean that basically every com company will have a significant presence in Germany, but very few will have one in Luxembourg? Because the, the numbers aren't scaled with, si with the size of the country. How did you decide on, on using an absolute number as opposed to? We tried, that's a try, to identify what could be uh, criteria for the uh, appreciation of a significant digital presence. Maybe uh, Stephen will uh, explain in more details how those criteria were defined. Basically, uh, this is a proposal, and uh, this is a point that can be discussed and that can be improved too. Uh, but we wanted to show uh, what were the criteria that define a significant presence. So, for the rest, which is the difference between our member states, uh, I think that the point of discussing, discussing user value or user value creation uh, also tends to uh, uh, not put too much. Uh, 
emphasis on national problems, but to deal with that globally at the European level. Because again, what we're proposing is a European approach to what is a European problem, and more than that, a global problem. Very good. Let's go here. Uh, and please wait for the mic. Hi, good morning. My name is Philip Ellison. Mr. Commissioner, um, sort of like the, the distinction between digital and real, uh, we have the distinction between value capture and actual services on the ground. Um, when you set a EU-wide floor or ceiling for taxes, um, we have a phrase in America that we like to use now called disparate impact. You have member states all with you know, public uh, finance problems and, and many of them have differing levels of need when it comes to infrastructure and that's the, the, the again, where the, where the digital becomes real, where infrastructure actually supports the digital economy. So I'm just wondering, you know, when you do that, either floor or ceiling, won't you have member states who are going to say, wait a second, I actually need more on the, on the delivery side from the value you've captured to deal with my real problems in my country? There are two very relevant points in what you said. The first one is about the distinction between digital and non-digital. And that's where the structural approach is superior to the interim approach, by definition. Because in the future, uh, this distinction will be very difficult to design you will have digital everywhere. Uh, and that's why uh, with the uh, structural approach, uh, you have the approach to tax all businesses, whether they are uh, classical, traditional, or whether they are digital. And that is why we really need to move to that uh, corporate tax system of the 21st century, uh, as well with significant digital presence, but also with CCCDB, which is a, a, a structural approach of uh, harmonizing or creating a common base taxation in Europe, which we don't have already, and also at a consolidated level, because uh, we have groups which intervene all across uh, Europe. Second point uh, is about uh, the revenue side. Well, the threshold of 750 million euros is a threshold which is very often mentioned in OECD uh, decisions, and that's why we picked it up, because we didn't want to invent from scratch a new threshold which would have been uh, or sound arbitrary and so we picked things that exist. But in the end, to avoid what you say, uh, the demands from this or that member state, one idea could be, it's an idea that I share with the French president, is that uh, the resource of this tax could become an own resource for the EU as such. Uh, so a contribution not to national budgets, but to the EU budget, to finance common infrastructures. And to give you uh, two figures, 5 billion euros, that would be probably the resource uh, driven by the 3% tax, uh, that's uh, half of 10 billion, and 10 billion is approximately what we will lose in our budget from the Brexit. And so uh, it would be useful to compensate that at least a bit to uh, stick to a quite dynamic uh, budget, and especially uh, dynamic investment budget for the EU27, which will be uh, our EU uh, one year from now, uh, 20, 29th of March 2019. So let's go over here. Hi, my name is Kathy Schultz. Um, as you're putting together this, um, you're talking about the new corporate taxes that need to be um, raised from the digital companies. We have the income tax that is based on profits. You now have a new digital service tax that is gross receipts tax that is not based on profits, it's based on something else. And then we also have the VAT, which is an indirect tax. So we're now gonna have three separate type of taxes the companies have to deal with. And because you're taking this out of the income tax, how do companies try to avoid a double taxation because it's also out of our tax treaties at that point? And how are you planning on having three separate type of taxes running? Does this look more like an income tax or does it look more like a, an indirect tax? And why not do it through the income tax where there are other ways of being able to handle this and doing it as a profits tax versus gross receipts? I repeat that again and again. Uh, I think the best way to tax is to tax profits. 
And that's what the uh, structural reform is about. And then we've got VAT, which is an indirect tax. And then there will be a third way of taxation, uh, which looks more uh, that what we already do with corporate tax. Um, and this should be de deductible because we want to uh, avoid double taxation. But the best is that it's really an interim solution. Uh, we didn't ask for, for, for a total for tax, the Commission, but uh, member states wanted that. And they were legitimate to do that because, again, uh, if we wouldn't have proposed that, uh, this is the only way to, to create short-term revenue. They would have had their own national tax. And you would have had not an EU tax, which would be reasonable and temporary, but a French, a German, uh, etc. Uh, tax, which have been a, a lot of complication, uh, also would have created an administrative burden and compliance costs for the business. And that's why I think this must be considered as it is. Uh, interim, avoiding double taxation, um, uh, European, uh, avoiding any kind of uh, mushroom approach to the internal market. But uh, in the end, uh, well, that's profits that should be taxed. But to tax profits, first you need to be capable of identifying where they are created. And this is why we need the significant uh, digital presence concept to be defined. Uh, it's much better that if we can do that at the global level, and again, we are willing to do that, and we are, I think, good contributors to the OECD and G20 work, uh, but um, we also have to, to, to show uh, or to lead by example, and that's what we uh, have the ambition to do now. Good. Um, let's go all the way in the back over there. <coughs> yeah, uh, my name is Roger Cochetti, and I work with private equity in the technology sector. I wonder if you could discuss a little bit uh, the topic of exemptions or carve-outs, either for small business or government or government-related entities or any other categories where you would envision exemptions to the both to the interim and at a more philosophical level in the long term. Thank you. I think that Stephen Quest will be more able or capable than I am to uh, present that in detail. Okay, very good. Frankly speaking, Stephen, you're going to do that. Very good. <laughs> um, let's see, any other um, questions from the audience? Um, because otherwise, I'm going to ask you, and I don't know if you want to answer this question, but without naming uh, countries, can you explain a little bit what the political dynamics are around, this, uh, around these proposals? Which countries are more skeptical? Which ones are uh, less skeptical? Um, you can make it as concrete as you want. There is no secret, mm -hmm. because some of them have already declared that they were quite reluctant. Uh, I will mention two of them, which have been very uh, vocal. Uh, Ireland, Luxembourg. Uh, and in the meetings that I've had at the uh, permanent representatives, let's say the ambassadors to the EU meetings or to ministerial lead meetings, I could see that uh, the unanimity is not yet there. <laughs> for those who fear this tax, they have to be reassured by that. For those who hope for it, they uh, still have, uh, there still is a, a bit of work to be done. Uh, but I would add two things. The first one is the half empty, half full uh, glass. Uh, the press mentions the reluctant countries, but uh, there is a very strong basis of support. I would say around 20 states are either very favorable or favorable to the tax or accepting the principle. And among those, uh, there are the countries of the so-called G5, which are the five biggest countries, uh, France. France is certainly at the forefront of support. I'm not mentioning it first because I'm French myself, uh, but it was a push. The initial push was from, from France, uh, then Germany, Italy, Spain, and UK are supporting uh, the uh, approach and they are uh, at the forefront. So 20 supportive or accepting, the rest either reluctant or not supportive, that's probably the beginning of the discussion. Second point, we've got little time. Uh, if this is not concluded by the end of the year, it will be difficult to conclude before I don't know when. So, for those who support the uh, proposal, and I'm not only supporting it, 
uh, I'm driving it. Uh, we need to put a lot of political capital and to uh, dedicate energy uh, to that. Uh, there is a capacity to convince. Uh, there is a way to find a consensus, I'm quite sure. There can be also some amendments here or there because uh, it's not never, our proposals are never take it, leave it. They, they are proposal to member states. I would say that there is a reasonable chance or reasonable risk, uh, depends on where you stand, uh, towards this proposal, that it is adopted. Uh, sometimes there are proposals I know that will take years. This time, well, it's, it's worthwhile trying. And we are going to try, to try hard uh, to uh, reach there. Uh, and there is one argument uh, which I will combat. is the idea that it will create delocalization. We are talking about the tax, again, which is spectacular, uh, which uh, also is sensitive to public opinion, very sensitive. The idea that the GAFAs or the rest of the digital economy should pay their fair share of tax uh, whilst uh, they don't and uh, ordinary citizens do, uh, well, it's in the public moral, something which is very, very sensitive. Uh, but one argument is not fair. It's the idea that with a tax of 3%, bringing uh, 5 billion revenues, uh, we will create delocalization either from the EU or inside the EU, makes no sense. Because everybody here knows what the EU is. Uh, it's uh, a market, a single market, of uh, 500 million uh, people with high purchasing power, and probably for those companies, the biggest, or one of the biggest markets in the world. And well, uh, they're welcome there, they need to be there, we need them there, and uh, so there won't be any kind of delocalization. So that's a very serious prop proposal, a very ambitious proposal. We try to lead there, uh, but it's not a drama. It must not become a drama, e either with uh, our friends from the United States, whether they are uh, governmental or non-governmental or business, and we are, of course, open to dialogue. Thank you so much. I will Thank you meet very much. Secretary On that of State. Confident and optimistic note. I will let you. I will let you go. Well, uh, <coughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm rather the optimistic type. Uh, I think that's uh, something that is worthwhile defending. Uh, and uh, my motto is always that when there is a will, there is a way. Uh, clearly, here there is a will. We'll see for the way. Very good. We're serving lunch right outside. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll reconvene in about uh, 20 minutes, I think. Um, and this will look different. We'll have a panel set up, uh, and we'll go a little bit more into the, the details and technicalities. Um, excellent.
All right. Um, we're almost ready to get started again. Uh, I think 90 seconds from now. Uh, there's a, uh. Um, all right, now we're going to talk about uh, uh, some of the details that uh, Commissioner Moscovici uh, mentioned, but we're for sure also going to talk about the, the big picture. I know, for example, this tax these tax proposals are uh, Itai's favorite tax proposals uh, that he's ever seen. Oh, I think and they're so great. so I want to give him the opportunity <laughs> to, to talk about him uh, first, then we're going to go to Joanne to Will and then to uh, Stephen Quest of the commission who uh, is wearing his bulletproof. Uh, vest, he told me. Um, he thought you want to go first. Yeah. So, I mean, first, thanks to everybody for being here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be at AEI, and um, you know, it, it, this is a, a very interesting debate. And uh, I'm glad that um, we're talking about the commission's um, digital tax proposals. Uh, I think to have the conversation, two background points are necessary. The first relates to the so-called BEPS project, launched five years ago at the OECD by the G20 to reform the international tax system. And the second is about the consequences of US tax reform. So when the BEPS project began, digital was a special focus because it was thought to be an important case of stateless income, of zero taxed income. And in fact, large US firms based in Silicon Valley were achieving genuinely low rates of tax on foreign earnings. Now the situation with respect to US tax law has changed. What the United States did in the international corporate tax part of the 2017 reform was to, in effect, enact the Obama administration's minimum corporate tax rate proposal, except at Republican rates. That's what actually happened. Um, the US enacted a reform under which intangible-driven US-parented multinationals will not have an effective tax rate on their foreign earnings that is below 10.5% ever. What this means is that BEPS leading to stateless income is now only about non-US headquartered multinationals. Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, the four companies specifically mentioned in documents that came out at various points from the commission, the French government, and the German coalition agreement, each face a 10.5% minimum tax on their foreign earnings. Since every EU member state has a dividend exemption system that does not include a minimum tax, and instead provides a 0% tax rate on foreign earnings when repatriated, companies like Volkswagen, Allianz, Daimler or Siemens in Germany, or BNP Paribas and Carrefour in France, they do not face a minimum tax burden on their foreign earnings. They can, in various circumstances, absolutely still do generate stateless income, a 0% rate on their foreign earnings. That's the reality of current US corporate tax law as compared with the current corporate tax law of the largest continuing members of the EU. These simple facts re reveal that the rhetoric we just heard from Commissioner Moscovici may contain some element of truth about the past, but is obviously and just clearly demonstrably false as regards the present. And here's the thing. I mean, I think either the commission knows that or they should know that at this point, like we've had a few months. Um, what that also means is that when the commission proposes a solution for the digital sector, their proposal isn't about addressing stateless income or an unlevel playing field anymore. It's about a revenue shift and a move towards taxing companies where their customers or users are. If they were really serious about the single tax principle in the digital space they used to talk about, then the commission would have dramatically changed their proposal in the wake of US tax reform. 
But instead, as Commissioner Moscovich told us, they're just trotting out the stuff they had from before. Um, right now, their interim proposal is a turnover tax that is surgically targeted, intentionally or not, to overwhelmingly, as a revenue percentage matter, hit US headquartered MNCs, while European digital startups are protected, and any sector where there are significant European companies is carved out too. Publicly available data on things like revenue shares of digital advertising in Europe can just show you blatantly that the overwhelming majority of the revenue from this tax will come from US MNCs. And again, this is despite the fact that because of US tax reform, the only digital companies that can't achieve a 0% tax rate on their foreign headquarters are the US headquartered ones. A 0% rate is still fully available to European headquartered MNCs. The second point that I want to make is an even more fundamental criticism. From a logical perspective, the motivations or principles described in the commission's documents just cannot and they're not, therefore will not be constrained to what they define as the digital space. Consider the focus on user participation and data that they use to justify their proposals. The commission came, claims that the key special feature of the digital companies is users participate by giving data in exchange for free services <coughs> that then allow the digital companies to sell something to others. But what is a clinical trial? It is a company giving thousands of people free medicine in exchange for their medical data. That medical data is then used to perfect a product and get regulatory approval for a patent and sales in a country. How is that not user participation in exchange for data? It's the same thing. Separately, consider the commission's focus on digital platforms, granting access to a marketplace. Parse through the rhetorical flourishes and the concern is about cross-border brokering intermediation of transactions between unrelated parties without being in the country of the customer or what um, uh, you know, Commissioner Moscovici just called interfaces that facilitate transactions. That's, that's the language he used. Sure, Uber and Airbnb are cross-border brokering intermediaries, but so is every financial firm and insurance company in the world that does cross-border business. So why isn't this a debate about how to tax those businesses? And what about when financial and insur insurance firms engage in their cross-border brokering over the internet? What's the relevant difference from Airbnb and Uber then? Those are just two examples of how a debate that is said to be about digital taxation can't be rationally constrained to what the commission labels digital and is actually about allocating taxing rights generally. The principled question is whether we should tax on the basis <coughs> where consumers are rather than where services and products are invented or created. In tax policy jargon, that's called a destination basis tax system. And interestingly, although the commission's proposals on digital are the biggest current push towards a destination based international income tax system for the corporate community, Europe in general is worst off uh, in a switch to a destination based income tax system because on net, it is a quite heavily export-driven economy. Now, as an academic, I see some attractions to a destination-based income tax and also some issues. The thing I fear is that we may get there in an uncoordinated, one-tenth baked way with a damaging transatlantic tax and trade war first. Um, and look, among many other things, um, there are provisions in the 27 bill that actually give the US Treasury Authority to go towards destination unilaterally if they really wanted to. So if Europe heads that way in part, the US might end up going that way in part too, who knows, okay? But, but <clears throat> if I were the US or the OECD, well, I think there's some important questions that should be answered before any report is issued or any specific sector proposal is made, let alone debated and adopted. 
um, if the goal is to avoid a chaotic move to destination-based taxation and the possible risks to the tax portion of the broader liberal order for free trade, especially at a time when that order is just quite obviously <laughs> under threat on both sides of the Atlantic. And that's just where I am. Thank you, uh, Itai. Let's, let's turn to Joanne. Joanne has slides. I have a few slides. Let's see if they, well, there we okay. go. Okay, you also have to know who I am. It's Joanne Weiner, I'm, I'm at GW. Um, I also want to um, mention that uh, I've been working on the issue of state corporate taxes and EU taxes for uh, since the 80s, uh, both at the Treasury Department yeah. and then I lived in Brussels and worked with them on their CCCTB proposal. So I come at this issue from an academic or from a tax person's uh, point of view. Um, but the idea of how to tax, uh, you know, digital services or whatever is very difficult. Um, the states have, you know, there are 50 states plus the District of Columbia, 27 of them now tax digital products, a bunch of them don't. Five states don't even have a sales tax. So this idea that you're going to have a uniform tax in the states on anything is just never going to happen because having grown up in Oregon, I know that no matter how much they want to have a sales tax and need a sales tax, they're never going to get one. Washington State doesn't have an income tax, they won't have one either. Um, so a lot of the tax rates depend upon the type of good in, every, in anything, but basically the states are sovereign and they want to tax what they want to tax. The map here comes from a company called Quaderno, gives you a rough idea of which states do tax. I'm going to talk a, quite a bit about South Dakota for a very obvious reason, which is that there was a huge case heard at the Supreme Court on Tuesday about whether the states are able or allowed constitutionally to tax out-of-state companies who don't have any connection with the state other than by a, if they, if they have no connection there, with that, if they don't have a physical presence. Although, That's just to the, be clarified, this is for sales taxes, guys. It's a sales These are tax, consumption not, taxes. I'm going to get to income taxes yeah, pretty yeah. soon. So yeah. that's really where I know <laughs> my, my knowledge lies. Yeah. <laughs> um, but just to give you an idea that uh, there's a, a range of taxes there. Um, what is going to be taxed if you're digital, any sort of downloading, any sort of on online, <coughs> vid video, electronic goods, what have you. It, if it can be digitized, it can be sent anywhere without having a physical presence. Um, what about income? Well, don't bother with this formula here. I, I, this comes from the Multi-State Tax Commission. I did a paper last year uh, with Elliot Dubin of the MTC. And if you're taxing income, it's allocated to the state by a formula. So you have two problems in taxing digital goods. One is, on the sales side, do they have a physical presence in that state? Typically, uh, I mean, since 1967 and reinforced in 92, the Supreme Court has said a state can't tax an out-of-state seller if they don't have a physical test. That's, what that, that's what's at issue in Tuesday's court decision. Turns out it's probably going to be closer than people thought. I was talking with my friend Alan Viard um, about this, um, and uh, we're all eagerly awaiting the outcome. On the income tax side, the Supreme Court has not set a bright line physical presence test. The federal government did, I mean, Congress did a, quite a while ago, and that <coughs> it more or less says the same thing on the income side. Um, but um, taxes are sold, I mean, levied on the goods sold there in whatever form. Income is apportioned using some formula based on where the business activity is. Um, so what's where and what to tax in the EU's digital world? I'm skipping that interim 3% tax to focus on the triple CTB, because that's where I worked on the issue for several years while I was in Brussels. They're going to use a formula based on sort of where physical things are. How do you know where income is generated, where are profits generated? We don't really know. I mean, I could argue they're generated somewhere on this planet, so just give us some of that income and then we'll tax it. Um, that's not going to go very very far, but anyway, that is one thing that we could, we could argue about. Um, I will say that at the Treasury back in 1998, there was a report on the taxation of electronic uh, business that I worked on that said basically you can modify the current rules. There's nothing new under the sun. I would say that since 98 there's been a lot of new under the sun coming out, um, but um, um, so we do have to modify things. Um, where and what's a tax in the EU's digital world? Presence based on things that you can actually hold in your hand, I would argue. Um, revenues, supply and digital services, tenth, uh, users, and business contacts. Uh, that seems, you know, that's their idea there. What's, to, what's today's uh, state news? Well, it's literally yesterday's news. Do you need a physical presence there? And it was the Wayfair case, um, and I won't go into more on, on that, but do you need a physical presence? Um, Barclays was the last big state tax case th that the Supreme, Supreme Court dealt with, and that had to do with whether or not California's corporate income tax system was constitutionally acceptable, and the Supreme Court argued, yes, it was, 
in part because if everyone adopted California's method, then there'd be no double taxation. I actually worked on that brief when I was, I'm an economist, but that's the only brief I've ever worked on, um, and the Solicitor General supported the uh, state in that case. So there's a lot happening there, and the problem is that in this sales tax case, and this is coming up, that companies are paying a sales tax, but even if they don't pay it, well, the customers, they're the users. They're supposed to pay the sales tax. Well, a lot of people don't realize that, and that came up in the, in the arguments on Tuesday, that if, I think it, uh, it was Sotomayor who said, well, isn't the problem really that your customers aren't paying the use tax? Why don't you figure out a way to collect it from them? And I can't tell you how many people who, when we start talking about taxes, fall asleep. <laughs> but more, uh, when they talk about uh, sales tax, they say, well, but I'm going to ship it out of state to a place where I don't have to pay the tax. And I remind them that, in fact, they are liable for the use tax. It's just very easy to not pay. Um, I don't have my phone in hand, but of course, the smartphone has more power than any of the machines that sent, uh, the, the computers that sent Apollo 11 to the moon and back. Um, some of the funny comments that came out in, this, in the court case, uh, in the arguments on Tuesday, um, were, um, it's the, the fact there are mass, the, aren't the problems with the brick and mortar stores, the fact that um, there are just massive discount sellers. It's not necessarily online, but it's that you've got companies that have discounts. Alito said, well, we have two options, chaos, or let Congress set the rules, which is basically having nothing happen. Um, Kagan said, well, Congress has had a chance to act, but it didn't, so it must approve this. I think people who, are, who work in legislation in, in Washington might not necessarily agree with that. Um, Ginsburg says, well, shouldn't Congress fix our obsolete precedent? Why do we still require a physical presence to tax when things don't have a physical presence anymore? And Breyer, who seemed to be a little confused, said, I read all the arguments and I agree with all of you, but you can't all be right. Uh, that was sort of a fight thing. And then um, and Gorsuch said, well, these concerns about small mail order sales seem a little bit antiquated today. And it's sort of funny because he was talking about Sears Roebuck and the gigantic catalog that the mail order, you'd sit there and you'd flip through and say, oh, mommy, mommy, I want that. That's long. That's, that's ancient history. So clearly things have changed a bit. Um, but what I, want to, uh, what I want to talk about before I, before I conclude is that, you know, the digital disruption happened a long time ago when Apple decided to start charging for music. Remember Netscape? You could get it for free, free downloads. Apple said, no, wait a second, we can't give our stuff away. How are we going to make money if we give it away? So for about four years, people were able to buy music for free, <coughs> download it for free. Apple said, we're going to, you have to pay for it. Why is that any different now, requiring people to pay taxes on stuff they order? And um, the other thing is that this digitization, companies that say it's too complicated and expensive to collect taxes, well, digitization reduces a lot of your costs. You don't have to have warehouses. You don't have to like box things up and mail them. And one of the studies I was reading, uh, this is for my, uh, my econ students, is that there's a, a billion dollars in consumer surplus generated from having digital products out there. Um, so there's a lot of benefits to it. And let me just point out one thing. There's this book. You can buy it in three ways. I hope you buy it in every way. Um, it's my book. <laughs> um, it's in my hand here. If I were to buy this book in South Dakota from a store there, I'd pay South Dakota's sales tax on it. I happen also to have downloaded it, no surprise, on my Kindle. No one would tax me on that now. What if I ordered it online from Amazon and had it delivered? Amazon actually now collects sales tax everywhere, but what if I ordered it from the publisher who doesn't have a presence here? Two of those, the only version of this book that is taxable is the one I buy in the store, store in South Dakota. And I argue, why should the Kindle version be free? And why should the book that I buy from someone who doesn't have a presence in the state also be free? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Joanne. You, you, get to, you get to respond later. <laughs> we'll oh. oh, wait, you want, you want me to say something? No, no, no. Oh, okay. Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> it's like, it's like, uh, I, I saw you itching. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> you'll catch it. You'll catch yeah, it. I know. <laughs> Uh, Will, you want to go here? Uh, well, after my two distinguished academic colleagues, I'm just a <laughs> humble country attorney. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I'm, I'm going to focus a little more on the practicalities of this. And as some of you know, uh, I do a lot of work with the OECD through BIAC and uh, also with the, the Commission through uh, the American Chamber in Brussels. And uh, I do think that there is a very practical aspect uh, to this. And there's also a political aspect as well. And the Commissioner uh, touched on this. And I don't think... Um, 
you know, policy aside, we can uh, ignore the political aspect, certainly in Europe. Um, there, there is an element of this being a burning platform, uh, and therefore I think we need to address that. And, you know, I, it, it sounds self-serving to say if we don't do something, then everybody else is going to do something, but there is, uh, I think, actually some truth in the fact that something will happen, and if it happens in an uncoordinated way, then that's not great. And that's not to say that, you know, sort of um, one wrong is better than 27 or 28 wrongs. I'm already dialing back that one. Um, uh, 28 wrongs. Um, but, you know, there is a practical aspect to this, that, um, that there is a lot of pressure, um, particularly in the G5, but outside of those larger countries as well. And therefore, we need to think about it. And I think also, if we're, you know, again, if we're being clear about this, uh, I agree. I agree with both uh, Itai and uh, Joanne that there are many things which are not new here, but there are also some things which are new. Uh, and I think that we have to, uh, to look at those and to, to, to focus on them. What I would then go on to say is that, however, I don't think we yet fully understand that. Um, uh, and that, therefore, uh, rushing towards solutions, uh, I don't think, is what we, what we should be doing. Um, and I understand, again, that, obviously, the EC proposals, plural, there are two proposals, one is longer term, one is interim, um, and that the commissioner said, and I believe him, that he prefers the longer term solution, that he wants to look at these structural issues, uh, and I think that that's right. Uh, at the same time, I am concerned that if the interim proposal, which um, to most people's eyes <coughs> is the one getting the most attention, uh, is also enacted in some form, then that is going to damage the longer term conversation. Now, to be clear again, I mean, I said I've been involved with the OECD for quite a long time. Uh, I know that OECD conversations have um, this reputation of going on uh, almost forever, where, where forever is 10 years anyway, um, which seems like forever in politics. Um, we are not talking about that. If you read the OECD document, uh, it talks about coming up with an interim report uh, in 2019. It talks about a final report in 2020. It acknowledges that there has to be a resolution of the issue by them. Uh, it sort of leaves unsaid, well, what happens if there isn't a resolution? But the answer clearly is, you know, at that point, this, this process hasn't worked, and therefore other countries will do something. But I do believe that that longer, slightly longer conversation is one that it's essential to have. Why do I believe that? Well, to go back to what I just said, there are some things which are clearly old in this process, not old in the sense of, um, you know, out of date, but old in the sense of things which we have already come across, things where there are analogies, whether it's physical delivery versus digital delivery, as Joanne was talking about, uh, or whether it's, you know, as Atai was talking about in relation to uh, medical trials, for example, uh, or actually whether it is, you know, people who have interacted through returning those postcards, which I always seem to lose, you know, when you buy something, you send it off, and you put information. <coughs> there are elements here which we understand, um, but there are also new elements in it. I, for one, don't believe that active user participation, which um, obviously is, uh, at least in the, in the short-term proposal, the interim proposal, digital services tax proposal, uh, is a key element to it. Uh, it's clearly an interesting idea, and there are clearly some circumstances where what the users do, so not just sort of passively hand information over, but actually interact with others, that there is something interesting and a question there which needs to be asked because there is something possibly uh, new about that. Do I think that that is the super factor which determines all value in the digital world? No, I don't. But I don't think that we're going to get to that, uh, you know, those questions unless we ask um, these in a more structured way uh, over a slightly longer time period. Likewise with data, I do not believe um, that all data has value. Some data clearly does have value. When does it have value? Well, it has value in some cases, clearly, when, it's, when the algorithm is applied to it uh, and when something is done with it. However, I've spoken to enough people uh, in the industry now to understand that there is a lot of data which is collected which is never going to have any value at all. Um, so it's a question of how you use that, how you do that. Again, to, to sort of bottom this conversation out and to try and reach a stable base to move forward from we need to have that slightly longer term conversation. So the concern again that I have about the interim proposal, um, I mean, putting aside issues with turnover taxes, uh, is that actually, you know, it may take, and you know, you're talking to the guy who had a hand in writing check the box, um, you know, it may, take just, <laughs> it may take just enough pressure off the conversation 
for us not to move on to the longer term <clears throat> conversation. And therefore, we end up with an interim solution which goes on forever, um, which again, uh, I think would be a mistake. Um, the commissioner expressed some skepticism both as to the scope uh, and to the speed uh, of, the, of this broader conversation of the G20 OECD conversation. Um, that may be, um, but equally, I think that that is the right place to have a conversation with the inclusive framework, which I agree, it's 113 countries. It makes it more difficult to, to reach agreement. But if you have the OECD, if you have the BRICS, and if you have a, you know, a significant number of developing countries, and you can begin to articulate principles which all of those agree on, then that is the best thing to try to do. And I think it's worth giving that a shot. So I do think that this is a conversation which needs to, to happen. I don't think that everything is new. I think, things, I think some things are new. I do also think that we have to face up to the, the you know, what, what, what digital progression gives us. And you know, this should not be a conversation about GAFR. It clearly shouldn't be. It shouldn't be a conversation about tech companies. It should be a conversation about what digital is doing to the economy to traditional companies as well as to non-traditional companies, to tech companies, to old companies, new companies, all the rest of those things. It's about what digital is doing. It's about how digital is transform transforming the economy. Uh, and within that, there are huge opportunities, but there are also huge challenges. Those challenges include disruption. That is what has the political effect here. Uh, I actually truly don't believe that it's the amount of tax that's paid that's really getting people concerned and riled up about this. It's the effect that it's going to have on their jobs. It's the concerns that they have about the future. And we need to build that in again when we have this conversation. So there needs to be a conversation. This is not something where we can say, nothing's changed. You know, the system's perfect. Um, things have changed. And tax bases are going to be disrupted as well as people's lives. And that is of concern to governments. And therefore, again, that explains the politics. Uh, and if there is this political pressure, then, you know, at least one of the folks in the UK is fond of telling me, well, of course tax policy is political. It's about money. Um, well, yeah, that's right. So, you know, we need to have this conversation. We shouldn't rush it. We shouldn't rush to conclusions. We shouldn't be grabbing for the first thing that looks like a silver bullet. We should not be working back from conclusions uh, to theory, which does occasionally happen in tax policy. Um, but we should have a serious conversation about what's new, about what might work, and about what a new stable system looks like. Because let's face it, from a business point of view, the system at the moment is almost completely unstable. And that is not good. Thank you very much. Um, Stephen, I assume you're, you're a fan of the proposals. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm wondering actually whether I'm on the right platform here, because I'm neither an academic nor a tax lawyer. Um, uh, and as you say, <laughs> I forgot my bulletproof vest. But, um, <laughs> Uh, but no, of, I mean, of course, we stand by the proposals. Um, uh, maybe three quick points, because, I mean, the Commission already said a lot, and I don't want to hog the platform here, um, but three points in part responding to some of what I've just heard. I mean, uh, the first is, I think, what we have to understand is this is a real issue. I mean, it's a real issue. It's a political issue. It's not an issue that's just driven by um, uh, thinking coming out of the European Commission in some sort of, in some bubble that is completely disconnected from the real world. So I think uh, what we've tried to do in the proposals we've made is to channel um, some of that thinking, uh, uh, to, to anticipate some of it to an extent, and to try to help contribute to a, to a discussion, but a discussion that's happening in the OECD. Uh, there's a report that came out last week from the IMF. Uh, I mean, there's a, there's a whole load of discussion about this. And when you're in the, in the G20 discussing with, with finance ministers there, you see it's not just a European uh, obsession that uh, you know, uh, folks in Australia are looking at exactly the same set of issues that we're struggling with here, including uh, including the sales tax and, and the physical goods as well. So I think it's a, you know, it's a real issue. Um, I think secondly, uh, at least my take is doing nothing is not an option. Uh, it's not because I'm a bureaucrat and uh, you know, bureaucrats make their living by, by doing things in a sense or proposing uh, legislation. But it's a bit between, you know, if the choice is between chaos and, and, and doing nothing, I mean, neither of those options are very attractive to me. Um, the, the, the digital disruption that we're seeing is real. Uh, and doing nothing means that the, the tax system remains uh, behind the curve, and that is not good for us uh, in terms of managing, uh, managing public administration and, and, and managing things prudentially. So I think we need, uh, we need to do something. Uh, uh, Will says, well, you know, we shouldn't rush it. I mean, uh, you know, the idea of rushing in the area of tax, I mean, you know, it, these things take time. Uh, so, uh, you know, but I think 
uh, you know, not rushing it should not become a synonym for, for doing nothing, and that's, there's, there's a risk there. And so I think the Commission was very clear. We're fully committed to working on this at international level uh, and at European level, uh, but not in an isolationist way. And that brings me to my third point, which is uh, very much an openness to engage and discuss. It's one of the reasons why we're here today, to engage and, and discuss. Uh, uh, but I think that we need to engage and discuss around the space in finding solutions, not simply in discussing about why there is no problem or why we're looking at the wrong thing, um, or why we're looking backwards rather than forwards. I mean, I take your point that uh, I mean, what you're saying basically is we're looking at past analysis and that since BEPS and since US <coughs> tax reform, the scene has changed fundamentally and so we should be looking at something different. I think. You know, there are elements there that one certainly needs to take into account, but if the position is, um, as a result of all of that, the problem has entirely just, just gone away and there is now no problem, I don't buy that analysis. I think that there are some issues there which are slightly more fundamental, which is still not fully dealt with. So we need to engage and discuss and try and find intelligent solutions. Uh, and the, the way to do that, uh, and, the, and the best way to do that, is engagement at international level. And we remain fully committed to doing that. Uh, but to do that, we need engagement at international level and international engagement. And that's part of what we're trying to stimulate as well with these proposals. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Ita, you wanted to say something? Yeah, so I, I mean, I, get, <laughs> I have some responses. I mean, the first is just to say, and I think this is important for me to understand. Actually, Joanne and I don't disagree. We agree completely. Why do we agree completely? So he says. Because, because, Joanne, <laughs> <No>. because Joanne <laughs> basically says you should be able to tax on a consumption tax basis, on a sales tax basis, digital goods and services. OK? That's what she's saying. And I agree. OK? So I agree completely on a consumption tax basis. And the EU has actually done a ton of work on that. They've done a lot of work on VAT. At, like, at, and, and actually, we're not fighting about that. So at least on this panel, you want to tax consumption of digital services, where the user is, where it's consumed, I'm on board. And so I want to be clear. Like, there is not actually an analogy between the US debate and what we're talking about with the Europeans. I agree with what Joanne is saying, but there's not an analogy. Because the second, the second point is, is that like, there's a question about nexus. So the, so, so the point is, is can you have nexus? So here's the thing. I actually don't think that the really fundamentally challenging thing is about nexus. I think we can all get around our heads around the idea that maybe there's such a thing as presence. The question is about attribution. It's about once you decide that you can tax in that jurisdiction, what percentage of the revenue goes to that jurisdiction? What is the formula, Joanne? Well, that is the actual question. And, and, and that is about attribution. That is about dividing up the pie and what the basis is for dividing up the pie. And you, you, don't think, have, you don't think the, it should be 3%? Well, the 3% isn't even trying to divide the pie. It's just a tariff. That's like a separate issue. But I'm just talking about the long-term solution. The 3% is basically like a tariff that avoids being a tariff. There's like a Politico document that leaked out of the commission where like it was like there was this question that some member state had asked that basically said, why can't we have it narrow and be more targeted? And it said because, and, and literally there's a document, there's a memo that says, because then it would more obviously just hit US companies. I mean, it says that. It was leaked. So yeah. like, you know, I mean, it's, it's obvious. Um, the, but the long-term solution is a serious conversation. It's a, it's a serious discussion. And the question is. is, on what basis are we going to tax? And so, you know, Stephen says there's a real issue. And <coughs> at, at that level, we agree. But when you talk about the um, idea of, well, you know, I mean, there's things that are happening that are, that are, that are, that are disturbing. So like the, the commissioner stands up here and he says, look, digital companies are taxed at 9%, traditional are taxed at 18 Okay, he says that. So that's based on a study by a German academic. The German academic has now, for a couple months, so since the proposal came out, been doing interviews on the radio and on TV and in the press, in German and in English, saying, you misunderstood the study. That's not what the study says. That's about the incentives that the Europeans have provided for doing things through intangibles. You've got us wrong. You, you mis, you're misquoting my study. And a month later, here's so it's, it's I mean, I'm going to be exact. You know, what is, it, what is it like? It's like Donald Trump pointing at some news article and saying, look, the, the, the Muslims in New Jersey were celebrating 9-11. And they say, no, that's not what the article said. And he keeps saying it. It's the same thing. <laughs> this is like that. Um, I mean, you've got to, let, like, let's be clear about what's happening, OK? Let's be clear about what's happening. Like, we, it is a real issue. There is a populist moment on both sides of the Atlantic. You, we, we need to talk about facts and truths. The fact and truth is, the, on this, on, in this space, Europe, 
wants a different allocation of profits, but their problem is they don't want a different allocation of profits generally. And they can't get past it themselves, and they feel populist pressure. And so what are they doing? They're just moving in this space. But that actually makes no sense. It makes no sense. And it's fair to say maybe there's something about data that's important. And it's fair to have a conversation. Maybe there's something about user participation that's important. Those are all totally fair discussions. But if you're going to have that discussion, you have to understand that you can't then just limit it to these companies that the commission calls digital companies. You have to ask, if there's user participation, OK, I want news for you. There are multiple European multinationals who give more than 100,000 Americans a year free medicine in exchange for their medical data. That's a fact. I can prove it. Um, <laughs> OK, That's you asked about the formula, <laughs> so I'll be specific on this here. <laughs> um, the formula reportsman is actually the thing, the area that I, know, that, that I know the most about. And I would say that in that area, yes, it's very hard to figure out where something intangible is. So you sort of look to say, well, what precedents do we have? What have the states been doing? And as it turns out, there are a lot of defunct companies that have made real marks in the state tax area. I've already referred to Sears Roebuck with the uh, sales tax. Jeffrey, the giraffe from Toys R Us, is the S South Carolina case that said that even though the out-of-state company, Toys R Us, didn't, or Jeffrey, didn't have a connection in yeah. South Carolina, they said it's OK to tax on their intangible presence. And that is now, that, did, ha that hasn't gone to the Supreme Court, but they right. said you create enough value with your giraffe out there in all those toy stores that this people recognize next, that there's the next value point. created here. And so, they're the states that have to deal with this. They have to figure out how to tax stuff. So there is a lot of precedent there. The formula is very hard to do. The states don't really have a good way of measuring where intangible income is located. It tends not to be in the factor that's the asset factor, which has usually physical assets. But the multi-state tax commission, which is out there trying to get it right, does say, well, if you have a user of this stuff, then in that state, and you can figure it where they are, and then you can tax it there. Now, I would argue that a company like if a company can figure out where they're selling their things, they certainly can figure out what tax there should be there. And the idea that you have an economic presence, however that's created, is something that's the future. And I disagree that we can wait. I think that the longer things go untaxed, the more people get used to not paying for they're it. They're not going untaxed. They're just being taxed <laughs> by the U.S. Anyway, the well, see, we don't agree, home. right? <laughs> They're but anyway, the there, are, there are solutions out there, and the various states have come up with them. Not all of them make a lot of sense. This economic presence is rather vague. But you get the point that the giraffe is selling something, and the trademark did create income in the state, even though it was an out-of-state company. So I want to, um, uh, I guess I want to put Will on the spot for a moment. The, I believe the German academic in question wrote this, uh, the 9% number comes from a report he did for PwC, I believe. <laughs> Um, would you, uh, <laughs> without talking about without talking about New Jersey in 2001, would you want to uh, maybe talk about what's in the report and what's not? Uh, okay. I would, uh, yeah, yeah, briefly. Okay. <laughs> um, so it, it it it's I think an annual report, although this, that may be in the first year. There will be another one this year, um, and uh, some things will probably be clarified in that. It it is a um, it, it's a stylized study which essentially looks at the incentives which are available um, for certain types of entities and the incentives which are available for other types of entities. And it labels those, I think, um, uh, digital and traditional or tech and traditional or something like that. Um, and looking at that, uh, it's, not, it's not an empirical study. Um, it's not based on uh, any particular tax numbers. It simply a, uh, you know, an absolute number and then runs it against Oh, sorry, a hypothetical number, and then runs it against the incentives which are available, and that's where you get the the nine percent. And I actually think it's higher than eighteen. I thought it was twenty-three or twenty-one or something like that. Um, but what this doesn't no, but what it, it this this does not tell you that those those are the uh, average ETRs, effective tax rates, uh, of digital companies on the one hand, and of, um, of traditional companies on the other hand. And so to 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 that extent, uh, when it's used uh, in support of uh, of that argument. The, it doesn't quite stand up. Uh, I mean, it does point out that um, uh, for, for very good societal reasons, uh, we decide that we want to try and incentivize certain types of innovative activity over other types of activity, and that's why we give R&D credits, uh, and it's why we try to encourage uh, investment as well. Um, uh, the study, as I say, is not an empirical study, so those aren't the numbers, those aren't the average ETRs. It does point out 
uh, how we treat that. And <coughs> I think that the next study will probably make that a little clearer. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to turn next to a question that uh, came from the audience earlier um, uh, that was referred to Stephen. Uh, uh, can you talk a little bit about firms that are, uh, or activities that are carved out or exempted uh, from the two uh, tax proposals? Um, so there are, there are rules regarding size, of course, in the uh, permanent framework, there are the rules on uh, significant digital presence. Uh, as Ethi pointed out, there are certain marketplaces that are included and, and, and excluded. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit and what, what drove decision making on, on what to include, what to exclude? Yeah, um, so in, the, in the, the structural proposal, if I can put it that way, I mean, the, the idea is to set, to set <coughs> thresholds um, uh, which would then capture these kinds of activities. So um, you've got a, a, a turnover threshold of, um, of 7 million euros, and then numbers of users and numbers of contracts. And so within that framework, I mean, there are no carve-outs as such, either you're in or you're out. The idea of this proposal, the structural proposal, is basically to bring these activities properly and fully as we see it into the net of corporate tax because we think that some of these activities are currently escaping from that net um, because uh, the, the, the permanent establishment is more virtual than physical and therefore it's difficult to establish the taxing rights and the nexus in order to do the profit attribution because there is no physical presence. So the idea is to use these, these considerations to trigger the significant digital presence which then enables you to start triggering ta taxing rights. So that's a fairly and it's a, it's a proposal that's designed to capture a wide range of activity. Um, uh, so it's different from the interim proposal uh, where the threshold is far higher, uh, 750 million, which the commissioner referred to mm -hmm. uh, worldwide and 50 million um, within the EU. Um, so it's clearly targeted a different, a different um, type of activity, a much higher type of activity. Um, and then within that, um, the, within the interim proposal, the the focusing on activities is much narrower because it's looking at the activities where we considered that the, the gap between the, the user value creation input and the ability effectively to tax it was the greatest. And so that's where, as the Commissioner mentioned, it's focusing uh, on areas where either user, um, user input is being used to drive, for example, advertising revenue uh, or where there is a significant degree of intermediation. Um, and so where there is in the, in, in the platform, there is an intermediation function, and it's, it's that which also drives the, um, the specificity of the proposal. And within that, there are, um, in the definitions, there are some relatively specific um, uh, uh, carve-outs, if you like, one referring to the financial services sector, um, and in particular, activities around crowdfunding and this kind of thing, to be specific, that we're trying, we don't want to capture that activity, which is of a specific type it's covered in other areas in our European legislation in the financial services area. So that we've, we've carved out, but it's the only really specific carve out of a particular type of activity um, uh, in, the, in the two proposals. So, so how do you justify that carve out? Like in other words, what is different between um, intermediating, besides the sector, but what's the relevant difference between a platform, okay, that sits outside a country and intermediates a transaction for transport services and a platform that sits outside the country and intermediates a transaction for insurance. What's, what's the relevant difference? Well, I mean, the, the specificity was that uh, we were keen not to impact negatively activities in the financial services sector which are uh, specifically looking to contribute uh, to activities like crowdfunding uh, and to into venture capital and not, and not hinder the growth of that market. That's not the prime target of this tax. And as the Commissioner said, it's an interim tax and it's designed to target the activities where the user value input is the greatest. And that's, I think that's the distinguishing feature. Now you can discuss this as much, you know, we can discuss this and, and it'll be discussed at great length, I'm sure, between the member states. I don't think we claim that the definition is perfect. By definition, it's, it's, it's a measure which is designed to be transitional and to be, um, uh, to therefore to be temporary and to be targeted. Now, if you're gonna target it, you've gotta target it on a specific range of activity. What we tried to do was to um, align it as closely as possible 
with the work and the definitions that were being worked on in the OECD, in the Task Force on Digital Economy, where the same type of activities were being discussed. Now, the report discusses all of this, and it, if, you, if you read the report, you'll see the way in which they create a kind of hierarchy of activities, and we've tried to align it with that without claiming that the report, uh, uh, there was a full consensus in the report that therefore these activities should be subject to an interim tax. The report is quite clear that there's no consensus on that. But in terms of the definitions we've used, there is an extremely high alignment between the, the proposal we've made and those definitions, as well as the, the, the design features um, uh, that, the, that the OECD report uh, covers in terms of ensuring that uh, it's, it's temporary, it's targeted, it's aligned with international um, uh, provisions, and that it's simple to implement. On the fundamentals, on, on, on user participation and data, okay? Mm -hmm. Just as a fundamental matter, do you believe that there is or is not a difference that matters, a relevant difference between user participation on a social media platform in exchange for, you know, they get free social media and they basically give them data about themselves. That's basically, the, Mark Zuckerberg puts it, you know, we work really hard to provide our service for free, right? That, that's how we do that, okay? Um, or um, a, a pharmaceutical company providing medication for free in exchange for coming in every week and providing all the medical data that you need, which is very deep, personal, biometric data to both improve products, and this is about saving lives, right, and um, get regulatory approval. Do you think that there is a fundamental difference or not that's relevant? Well, I think, you know, the, I can ask you the question back. The question is, in my mind, the extent to which we're confident that these different types of activities are being effectively taxed. The reason that we're focusing on a certain type of activity is that the analysis is that some of these activities are escaping effective taxation and therefore they need to be, we need to find a way to capture them. And the definitions are designed to do that. Now, whether the definitions do that or not is what we're debating. Uh, you're asking me what I believe. What I believe is irrelevant. The question is whether we can, whether we can, whether we can demonstrate that uh, and, and whether we can, we can pursue the legislative process along that. And that's what we'll see. I can demonstrate it. I've demonstrated it. Mm -hmm. In other words, I've demonstrated that the U.S. headquarters... You've asserted it. You haven't demonstrated it, but you're it's, asserting it. It's U.S. law. I mean, it is U.S. law that they will pay 10.5%. So perhaps you should put, take the proposal forward, but carve out any country that has a global minimum tax. <laughs> and, then, and then you're done. Then you've, then you've solved the problem. Why don't you do that? Give them the credit for it. Don't carve them out. Just give them have a credit. Fine. They'll live with that. Okay, taxes good. you pay to the U.S. are credited. <clears throat> Sounds like we've reached consensus here. Yeah. <laughs> um, he agrees with me. I want to. Yeah, that's right. Um, I want to give our audience the, uh, the the opportunity to ask a, a, a couple of questions too before we. Um, it's about the allocation. <laughs> um, uh, so let's do that, uh, and let's go right here, uh, table to front. Uh, same instructions as before. Hi, this is a question for Stephen. I'm Kathy Schultz. Um, as you're looking at taxing the platforms, have you looked at or considered what happens to the small and entrepreneurial companies that use those platforms within the EU? Because obviously, if companies are going to be paying additional taxes, those taxes are going to be passed along down the line. And what economic effect could that have that even though those companies are not in the 750 or 50 or whatever the number is, they're going to be affected by it as well. And have you taken a look at that economically? Are you talking here about the structural proposal or the or the or the the interim proposal? Well, I mean, the interim proposal is. I mean, it's not targeted at startups. Uh, no. You know, you, you no, I think I think she means there. Are, for example, yeah. there are small companies that in, that use Amazon's marketplace. Uh, for yeah, example. You're a small company. You are not going to set up your own internet. You're not going to set up your own systems. You use the platforms that are already in existence, and you pay a certain amount to use those platforms. Mm -hmm. But as those platforms are now going to be hit with additional 3% tax, that's going to be passed along to the small and the, and, and, the, and the entrepreneurs. And have you looked at how that's going to affect the smaller businesses within the EU? Well. This isn't uh, just going to hit the big companies because their clients and the people who are the users aren't all individuals. Some of them are small companies. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, uh, two things. I mean, the first is that for both of these proposals, we did 
present a full and detailed impact assessment. So we looked at a whole range of factors uh, and it accompanies the proposal. So you can go through it at your, at your leisure and look at the economic analysis. You can agree with it, you can disagree with it, but it's, it's there and it's part of our, it's part of our process. Um, uh, I think that um, it's also true that uh, what we're trying to do is to promote innovation and we're trying to, to stimulate the economy. Uh, uh, the intention is not to pass this on, uh, this on down the chain and, 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 through con and through consumers. But at the same time, uh, these platforms at the moment uh, are basically uh, benefiting uh, from very low effective tax rates. And that's not good for the economy either because that's also not very, it's not a level playing field. I think the, the Commissioner made this point very clearly. What we want to do is a level playing field and that everybody's paying the same rate of tax, whether they're big or whether they're small, whether they're digital or whether they're a more traditional type of business. And that level playing field, I think, is at a more fundamental level important to get in place. Uh, and that that's the, that's the, the sort of uh, uh, the objective of the exercise. Thank you. Um... And, you know, this, there are clear parallels here with the Wayfair case, right? There are small businesses that are worried about having to pay taxes in, where they're not physically present. But there's, of course, local small businesses who are not competing with... Uh, there's a de minimis there. test. For sure. Yeah, but, you know, once... So it gets cars yeah, yeah. But once something is in place, you know, that's what... Yeah. Happened, yeah. <laughs> um, very good. Let's see if we can do a couple more questions. Let's go over here, all the way on the left. Leonard Campbell. Um, conceptually, I understand taxes as basically a, a service charge for uh, something that the, that the state is rendering to whomever. Um, if a business is not located in a particular locale, I'm not clear on what the benefit is that they're, that they're getting. And so in that case, I'm not sure why they're being charged a, a tax at all. Uh, Stephen or Joanne, do you want to? I can, I mean. Start and I'll finish. If you're, um, if you're providing services to consumers who are in a certain jurisdiction, uh, even if you're doing it digitally, uh, I mean, these consumers are still consuming through digital infrastructure, which is often provisioned and serviced at some level by the state. Uh, uh, and so there is a whole infrastructure uh, and a utility infrastructure that, 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 that you need in order to access these services. So I think that there is, um, you know, why would you uh, get a beneficial treatment because you're able to provide these services virtually versus somebody who's providing them physically uh, when fundamentally the infrastructure issues are the same? Can I, can I have a go at this? Because um, this actually is something which has worried me for, uh, for decades. And I mean, I, I know there's a, a stream of Supreme Court cases on this, amongst other things. Um, but uh, that has always struck me as not the best reason for taxation, I suppose. Uh, and certainly in the international context, um, you know, the, the principle on which we've fastened, for better or worse, and obviously, you know, there's a very good paper by Wolfgang Schoen, which sort of uh, pokes, uh, tries to poke a few holes in this. But it, actually, the, the basis on which we um, do that is that under a, uh, under a profits tax, which is earned across borders, we need to find a way uh, to allocate taxing rights. And the basis on which we allocate those taxing rights is where does the activity take place which creates the value which leads to the profit. And therefore, that is actually not a question of infrastructure. Uh, it's not a question of uh, even, you know, so you have better terms for this than I do. Um, uh, but, you know, sort of where you pay a loyalty fee effectively um, for being there. This is actually about where, where, do the, where do the activities which create the value take place and then how, how do we... Uh, determine those, and that just just in case we don't get, I get a final word on this. That's why I think that the conversation we have, which doesn't need to take forever, but should take a you know a, a period of time, is to look very carefully at all the value creating factors, so that we can try and come up with some type of more reasoned approach uh, to doing this. But you know, I, I there are lots of theories which get thrown into this, but at its base, we are talking about how do we divide up profits. We can move away from a profits tax to be sure. But then we'll come up with something which is very different. But if we're going to divide up profit, then we need to know where that profit is earned. And the best way of doing that is to find out where the quote unquote <laughs> value creating factors are. Uh, thank you. I mean, I mean, just to be clear, like when I talk about moving to a destination based income tax, like that's not exactly the same as a single factor sales based formula apportionment. But like those two things are cousins, right? 
They're not, they're not unrelated. Let, let, let's be clear. I mean, I mean that, that, that's the reality. And what this is, all this is pushing us in that direction. And the question is, do you want it? And then the question is, do you think it's appropriate in a, sales based, in a single sales-based factor apportionment, right, to say, well, you know, all of the um, income goes to where the consumers are, even if all of the ideas and all of the research was, um, you know, done in uh, Denmark, right? So Denmark gets no value, even though all the thinking was done there. That, 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 that becomes the, the question that you have to ask, right? Um, and then, you know, similarly, uh, you know, you may, when you talk about these portion factors, care about like where the profits are generated based on our current concepts of um, expense allocation. So what do I mean about that? Take pharma again as the example. Well, so like half of the world's global profits, this is not an exaggeration, this is true. 50% of the global profits for the entire pharmaceutical sector are generated in the US, basically because we let pharma companies charge higher prices than other countries, okay? And we effectively subsidize the R&D for medicine for the whole world, okay? Now the question is, um, are you going to, um, uh, to, 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 to say, well, it's just, a, like, like the U.S. should just give that up, should give, now we tax half the profits, right? Or we try to, very start expense allocation. Should the U.S. give that up because there's some other formula? Like, these are the issues you get into, and it's actually about splitting up the pie. And the problem that the commission has is they don't want to acknowledge the conversation they're having, which is, the U.S. is about to say, we're not allowing there to be zero tax income anymore for the digital sector. We've imposed a minimum tax, which no European country has. And the commission wants to basically put its head in the sand and say, no, no, this is about them paying the right amount. But what they mean is them paying the right amount to Europe based on some formula. And the difference is, the thing is they want to apply that formula only in the digital space. And it's OK to say, we don't think that the existing systems allocation of income across the world is wrong. That's, and we want to have a serious discussion about that. That is totally legit. What is mercantilist is to then cut it off and pick a sector where like basically you have no big companies and one country, in, at least in your marketplace, has all of them. That's, that's the problem. That's the problem. It's not using Morgan to list in a positive sense, in case you're, in case you're wondering. <laughs> can, I, can I just can I sure. follow up to what Stephen said? So I, I, I thought that that's what you were going to say, and I, I appreciate you, you giving that answer. I'm just curious as to where the logic ends. Essentially, if I have a phone conversation uh, about a business opportunity, and I'm here, and the other person on the end of the line is in Europe somewhere, and I make money, am I then responsible for paying tax to, to Europe because hey, I used part of the European infrastructure in order to facilitate that phone conversation. Well, presumably your, the phone company pays taxes on its income right. and right. partially right. does that in Europe. Right, so. but that, that's already the case, so that's why I don't understand. I think the, uh, I think, and I'm going to overrule you here, is oh. that that is the issue that dealt, that the states dealt with when they taxed the worldwide income of companies. That was the big issue, and European companies who had no connection with the U.S. the state of California said, this is, we don't have, you know, why are you taxing us? And California said, well, all of your income because you're one integrated company is all connected. We can't carve it out. We can't set a transfer price on all that stuff. So let's just call it one global income and apportion it according to what's actually located in our state. That's what the Supreme Court said was fine. It had nothing to do with any benefit or whatever. There is a Supreme Court ruling that does have are the benefits related to the services provided, but they tend to sort of not, not pay as much attention to that, one of the four prongs. The states, though, found that their systems were discouraging companies from locating there. And so they voluntarily, with a little push from the federal government, <laughs> I don't know if you were a treasury at the time, but I was, said, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna stop this system at the water's edge. So to go to the UU's company tax reform, they have a formula, it's three factors, double-weighted sales, that says that, um, I mean, single-weighted sales, um, that says that we're gonna stop at the water's edge, though. It's only EU. They're not trying to grab US companies' income, but they're trying to find a way to balance supply and demand. Now, economists a long time ago said income is generated by assets and property. Well, that turned out not to really work very well because as Charlie McClure showed us, theoretically, whatever's in the formula is gonna be a tax on that factor. So yes, you're right, Itai that if you have sales-based formula only, it's exactly like a sales tax. 
And in fact, 27 states have an effective tax rate of zero on property because they have either no corporate income tax or a single factor sales tax. So there is a lot of movement happening there and the states are realizing that they can't tax stuff that is gonna move. They know where their sales are and sales-based tax is where it's going. And by the way, they also said they're gonna integrate this digital tax idea into the CCCTB. So it's not a standalone, let's go after the GAFAs. And so, so a lot of the things that I first learned about familiar apportionment, I learned from that book, from your book, okay? This is true, okay? And yeah, it's a great survive. book. I mean, she wrote a great book, okay? And, um, and, and, and... More and, agreement. No, I get like... This is true. This is true. I learned a lot from and, you, and you can yeah. buy it three different ways. Well. <laughs> it came from my PhD dissertation, by the way, so... And look, I mean, they... They, they, so now the CCCTB wants to add a fourth factor that's called data. So in that book you wrote, you say there's like no good way to value intangibles into these formulas. They don't want to value intangibles. They want to value like a subsection of intangibles and make it a huge part of the weight. Yeah. Yeah, just, just, just to be clear. <laughs> <laughs> now he's putting words in my mouth, <laughs> in my book. <laughs> the, the, the they here uh, is mostly a, the Econ Committee of the European Parliament. Right. Um, so this is this is not completely mainstream, right. uh, as far as the commission is concerned. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. I think we we reached uh, uh, a blissful state of harmony here. Um, <laughs> thank you all for thank you all for coming, and thanks to our uh, wonderful panelists. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.